tonight um, coming up this Thursday at 5 p.m. And in the student folder, there should be a link to that uh, Zoom. And there are a lot of incredible universities that are going to be speaking to the students. Um, universities such as the University of Georgia, the University of Michigan, um, Cal, um, and Gonzaga and so forth. So, so many different directors from debate programs are going to be speaking to students. And so you get some insight on just the college uh, application process, what's life like in college debate, and maybe what are some things that you can be doing to help um, use debate to get you the resources slash scholarships to go to college. And so I highly recommend attending College Night with Bottle this Thursday at 5 p.m. Of course, that's PST. Uh, the next is that we had a tournament and the tournament was super fantastic. We had over 50 students participate in both middle school and high school. And so that's always a really awesome turnout to see. And we're always looking for more and bigger um, amounts of students to be debating because we just love bringing debate to as many students as possible in the Bay Area. And so any and all students, including yourself, Sarah, if you know anyone um, at KIPS, I know enrichment programs aren't really a thing right now, who wants to be a part of an enrichment program that allows for them to do college nights, movie nights, competitions, and different prizes and fun. This is the space to come. It is welcome to any and all high school students. And so I'm a big, big, big supporter of bring your friends, bring everyone so that they're open and invited to attend all bottle events. They just need to register with a bottle form so that we know that you're here, that we know that you happened. Uh, and so another thing, so one, that's a real good recaps, a lot of things that we learned from running that tournament. And so we have another tournament coming up on December 6th uh, or December the so Saturday and Friday, it's the Saturday and Sunday, it's fall champs. This is what qualifies students to go to NODL, which is the national competition for the UDLs across the country. And so we need to get all students who are planning to attend registered by November 16th. Um, that is current registrants. And so um, definitely keep that on your calendar and let your coaches know and Sarah in the context of you and Johnny let me know so that I can get you all registered for that um, because it's a fun tournament Johnny and Kenny did actually really well at last year um, and so it'd be really awesome to see everyone there so please 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 consult your teacher slash coaches and if not consult your bottle representatives and we will help you get registered for the tournament. And the last announcement is that we do have an upcoming movie night that is scheduled, but that is not the only announcement that is left. So you give me just a few seconds. I will be able to get that. Oh, yes, um, of course. Uh, there are actually a few more announcements. Um, so yes, a few other announcements. One, to clarify, the next tournament is December 5th and 6th. That's a Saturday and Sunday. That's our fall champs. Just describe that. Another thing is that we have trophy pickup this Friday from 3 p.m. to 6 p.m. If you want it to come and get your trophy instead of it being mailed to you, Bottle will be doing a, um, what's it called? We'll have a stand outside with the trophies where we can do a safe uh COVID friendly, social distance, um, giving you of your trophies if you chose to do that. So please, please, please uh, schedule some time to come to the bottle office. Um, all right, so this is gonna be a little interactive. I'm gonna be switching in and out of the PowerPoint um, and the bottle evidence packet. And that is because I want to build this PowerPoint with you all, with you, Sarah, uh, but with you all who will later on watch this video um, to provide a better and more interactive sense of what's going on in the packet. So this is the counter plan debate. If you are familiar with the counter plan, that's awesome. A lot of this will then be a recap for you. And if you're not familiar or if you are not, this is also a great um, 
lecture because I believe that the fundamentals are so important in growing your skill level in debate. And so the fundamentals we shall uh, sit in in a specific application to the abolish ice packet in the model evidence set. So what is the counter plan? Um, these are competing advocacies. Uh, which means that they purport or they say that they solve the advantages better than the plan. Um, so there's like an internal net benefit for what then does better mean? Does better mean that the kind of way in which the, the counter plan solves uh, is a little bit less or less in scope of what the plan does and that that less in scope, i.e. a smaller maybe reform or a smaller abolition net better because there's something about what the counter plan or what the plan gets rid of that is bad uh, or the, there is something that the plan gets rid of that the negative would say is bad because it is good, the thing that the affirmative gets rid of. Hopefully that tracked and made some sense please, please, please be vocal when you're like, huh, what? But that is what an internal net benefit means. An external net benefit is like a disad. That's not present in the current packet because we just don't have a disad. We might add one as the season develops. Uh, but that's like a, an external kind of argument separate flow where they'll read like an elections dissed or a federalism dissed or um, in the context of this topic there are many different types so there's definitely been a courts dissed and bioterror dissed, bitcoin dissed, all the different stuff to why doing the plan has a substantial effect that is negative, so what I just described is a link argument, and that that effect leads to a really, really bad impact. So an example of this would be like, let's say the election dissent, right? So the uniqueness argument would be for like, Biden is winning now, but it's a very close race, and that things really need to stay the same. Trump does not need to pass any kind of progressive reforms because that may flip the vote in favor of him. The link argument is that passing any criminal justice reform bill would make Trump look hyper, hyper progressive, and that would swing voters. And that's bad, because that means he's likely to win. And then a scenario could be that another Trump election most likely could escalate into some type of armed conflict between the United States and let's say China. Does that make sense? Kind of that, that list, that kind of perfect. So that's kind of what the disad would look like in the context of an external net benefit versus an internal net benefit, right, as I just described, is more so there is a part of the, there's a portion that the plan, there's a portion of the plan that the counter plan says is good, uh, that instead of getting rid of that, we would not get rid of it because getting rid of it is a bad thing. So that's why it's internal. It's, it's kind of part of the 1AC. And that sound, this should sound similar to the evidence packet because that's exactly what we have is an internal net benefit. So uh, text is that the counter plan text is the actual plan that you think is better than the affirmative. And so the bottle counterplan text um, is that the United, federal, the United States federal government should end arbitrary immigration enforcement by reforming immigration laws to change all immigration crimes to civil offenses. Ne next, directing the HSI to immigration enforcement solely on criminals and national security threats. That is the, that's the CP text. Like those two bullet points plus the initial thing that is the counter plan text. That is what the counter plan defends that it will do. Um, and that it will get into how that competes with the plan in a second. This is just the structure of what a counter plan is. It needs to have a CP text and it also uh, needs to have a solvency mechanism. So the counter plan has to have a warrant for how it solves for itself. You can't just read a counter plan I mean, there are exceptions to this rule, but like we're not quite at the exceptions to this rule 
um, argument. There are some exceptions to, does the counter plan need to generate um, some separate, does the counter plan need to have like a card that says that it solves, right? Um, most are on the side slash the correct side that yes, a counter plan does need to say why or how, um, what it does solve in many ways, like how the affirmative does, right? You can't just read an app that says abolish ICE and you don't read any evidence that speaks to abolishing ICE, uh, or what that would look like, right? And why that is good. If you don't read any of that evidence and you go straight into impacts, I've got a a lot of questions as to how does the app solve. So those same questions um, are the same for the counter plan, right? Is how does the counter plan solve? What is like what what evidence is backing the statement of the CP text? Um, and so that's important. The next part of a counter plan is that you need to have a net benefit. Um, and the reason why and I kind of described net benefits when I was doing the difference between internal net benefits and external net benefits, um, but you need to have a net benefit for a counter plan. And that is the reason that, the, that is the reason for why the counter plan is better than the plan. You need like, it, it's not enough for why um, the counter plan is another option, because that's not a reason why you can, can't also vote affirmative. Right, like just saying, oh, okay, reform counter plan. Okay, so what is, why does that mean the app is bad, right? You need to create some competition and that's what the net benefit does. That means that it's not just you have provided another option, just because you provided another option doesn't mean the option of the app is bad or causes anything bad to occur. So that's why net benefits are really, really, really important. And sometimes this can be carded evidence, uh, usually when the net benefit is external. So like the disad would not be carded, or the disad would be carded, like an elections disad, a federalism disad, you kind of need evidence to back up a lot of the arguments that you're saying. Um, but often it will have to be written out as the net benefit will be, I'm <clears throat> sorry, a comparison um, between solvency advocates. So we'll go to the next one. So how does the reform counter plan text compete, compete with the abolish ICE text? This is plan. The United States federal government should defund and disband immigration and customs enforcement. That is the 1AC plan text. Now, in highlighting again is the counter plan text, I'll read it again, that the United States federal government should end arbitrary immigration enforcement by reforming immigration laws to change all immigration crimes into civil offenses um, and directing the HSI to focus immigration enforcement solely on criminals and national security threats. Plan text versus plan text or CP text versus plan text to keep things simple. Um, so it's really, really important that we understand uh, and can look at the two different texts and see what their differences are. Um, so what do y'all think? What is, where do the counter plan text and the plan text compete? What are some differences? This is me asking a question, so whenever you're ready. Um, is it that the um, plain text is asking to abolish it and the CPA text is asking for like a revising or like reforming of it? Yeah, and so what are those differences, right? Because clearly, right, there's like the reform versus abolish, but like what, if you have some more words as to what that means, right, in the context of abolishing ICE versus what the particular reform um, of the counter plan is, and that's in the text. We don't want to take a stab at it. No stabs. Don't want to try it. Thea, what do you think? Hey, what was the question? So the one was the how does the reform counter plan text compete with the abolish ICE text, so the plan text. So you see how like the counter plan text a lot more words than the plan text. What are some differences that you can pull apart? from the text of the counter plan versus the text of the 1AC plan. 
Well, like the counter plan advocates for like for like reform, basically. But the but like the plan, yeah, I guess we're doing fun for defending. I see. I'm sorry. What was the last part? Well, I, I said like the plan argued for def defunding and disbanding IC, but the counter plan uh, argued for the reforms. Difference between the AF plan text and the counter plan is that the first one wants to dismantle and disband ICE, just ICE, whereas the counter plan actually wants to reform immigration laws so that people can no longer be deported just because they came here illegally and they want to um, direct the HSI to focus solely on criminals. I think that's what Obama said he was doing, like deport criminals, not families or something like that. So I'm not sure how one would go about doing that. But what I focus on is the first bullet point, which is basically saying that people would no longer be able to get deported just because they came here illegally. Whereas the other one is like abolishing deport deportation as a whole. Yes, perfect. Exactly, 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 exactly. That is a great segue into looking at some of the evidence. I'm going to move you all over here. And it says, does the counter plan get rid of ICE? Does getting rid of ICE get rid of HSI? These are some questions that would need to be answered. Does the counter plan, so a question that I wanna ask you all in thinking about solvency for the counter plan, right? That's what we're, that's what we're like focused on a little bit is that does the counter plan get rid of ICE? Does getting rid of ICE get rid of HSI? Think about that. Think about that and read that. Think, yeah, so think about this, that question, this question, read this, and then somebody in two minutes answer that question for me. Can y'all still see the screen? Um, it's like halfway gone. It's, yeah, now I can see it. Okay. Y'all can still see it? Yes. Okay, I just wanna make sure y'all can still see it. Y'all can, wait, one more time, y'all can still see it now? Yes. Okay. So in two minutes, I'm gonna ask you, and maybe why do you think I asked that question? Why did I ask those questions in that way? Wait, Jasmine, oh, sorry. I think you're talking, Never mind. No, you're good. What was the, sorry. I just wanted to ask if HSI is the, um, do they primarily focus on the sex, like sex trafficking part or is it a bigger? That's the main part. Um, okay. Yeah, so like uh, human sex trafficking investigations um, is part of it. It was a part of a long kind of border, like border, policy initiative back, um, I believe, in the early 2000s, uh, when the ideas like smuggling both like drugs and folks across the border and how to kind of um, combat that. So like HSI was an, a, task for, a task force initiative in response to kind of that messaging, if yes, correct or true, but like it's, was part of that messaging. Oh, okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. One minute, y'all. All right, before we get a question or before I get some answers, who wants to read this for me? I can. Okay, read it out loud for us. Okay, let me get close to my computer. There is not much point in abolishing ICE if another government agency then gains the same power. Furthermore, untangling ICE from the rest of DHS can be tricky without wholesale reform. If the goal is to limit interior immigration enforcement to serious criminals and remove the constant fear felt by otherwise law-abiding illegal immigrants, there are American families and businesses in the United States then. There are two legal reforms that will 
functionally abolish ICE without disbanding the agency. The first is to reform immigration law to change all crimes into civil offenses. The second is to reorganize Homeland Security investigations by giving it some of the responsibility of ERO and then abolishing the la latter agency. Both reforms will substantially weaken interior immigration enforcement for non-criminals and abolish the worst part of ICE without removing its ability to deport serious criminals and national security threats. Abolish immigration crimes. Most violations of immigration law are civil offenses that are remedied through deportation. Criminal offenses are punished with jail time and fines. Oh, thank you so much, Katya. Um, I'm gonna mute it, no, I'm not. So first, does this meet the requirement for solvency? Remember what I had said um, earlier about how you need to have some evidence that says something about how the counter, one, what the counter plan would do, um, but more importantly, why that is good or why that is what the counter plan would be. So does it? meet that threshold? Does that, does that evidence do that? You know, this is a yes, no question. There's no tricks. There's no tricks in these. There's no tricks, I promise you. Sarah, thank you for offering yourself. So what do you think? Do you think that this evidence speaks to what the counter plan would do or say? Um, I think yes, because um, it says what it's going to do, like um, about reorganizing HIS and like giving their responsibility. And also it says that um, uh, like why they're doing it, like um, actually no, it doesn't say that why they're not doing it, that they're doing it again. Yeah. <laughs> so no, probably. What's so your answer? Wait, so your answer was yes and then your answer was no. So what is your no? Oh, cause it doesn't um, say like why they're doing it. It just said that like how um, they are going to do it. Okay, I want to. What are what are some other thoughts before I say anything? Me. It could be anybody. Um, thinking back to when I did research during the debate tournament, um, oftentimes you're not gonna find something that's gonna say like exactly what your p plan would do but this one actually does which is why i would say yes okay and so when you say why it does can you kind of what were the lines that got you what were the lines that were like okay yes this is what the counter plan is going to defend and that meets with what the plan text is saying um counter plan text my bad is saying i definitely am looking at the underlying portion that's saying there are two legal reforms that will functionally abolish ICE without disbanding the agency. And then it continues to basically name exactly what the counter plan is. So yeah, I'm, I'm in agreement with you. I think that that was an excellent note that you did add Katya about how very rarely are you going to find a counter plan that is like going to say 100% like, here is the counter plan to the affirmative. Here is how it solves. And here is, you know, all the things, right? Like, it's not going to be maybe as explicit, but so long as there is an argument for why it is consistent with what the plan does and how what the counter plan would do intuitively competes, then you're good. It just has to be pretty intuitively in line right? Um, and that comes down to the evidence quality, right? It's like how similar to what the affirmative is describing is what the counter plan um, would also be describing. So it's very, very important that we're looking at evidence, but in the context of the reform counter plan, we thought it was really, really important when putting this together that the evidence was very explicit uh, in saying that the reason why doing the plan is insufficient is because of the two things that the plan, the counter plan would actually do, right? Does that, does that logic come across to everyone? Isn't there a word for that? Isn't it called net benefit? 
Well, we're going to get to that, but yes. Okay. Right? Is that there needs to be a net benefit for the counter plan in order for it to be competitive, right? It can't just be here is another option and here is the app. Just because there's another option that potentially just can solve the affirmative, that does not mean that the affirmative doesn't solve for the affirmative, right? Or like counter plan solves better. It's not enough of a reason for why you just can't vote for the affirmative, right? Like there's not like a disad or a reason to why the counter plan solving better avoids something that the plan does that is bad. Does that logic make sense to everyone, right? Or it's not just good enough to say the counter plan solves for the entirety of the 1AC. That's not going to be enough to win why the counter plan wins versus the affirmative. That's like saying, what's a good analogy? That's like saying, let's say the affirmative is a, is a, is a bowl of grapes, right? And the negative came in with a bowl of strawberries, right? And this is for the audience for who these bowls are for are two, uh, two preschoolers, mm, two kindergartners. You know, I'm, we're choking on grapes. So two kindergartners, right? So AF is bowl of grapes. Strawberries is the negative. All right, the negative has a bowl of strawberry. We are, we have more fruit in our cup or we have strawberries. These are good and it's just as many strawberries in this bowl as the grapes. Does that mean that the bowl of the grapes is like not good enough as a snack for the students? This is a question. Edgar, what do you think? Uh, no, like, I don't think it means like the strawberry, the grapes are bad. Like they, they don't make a good snack. Right. Not mean that the grapes are bad or they don't make a good snack. But let me add this new situation to the same scenario. Um, one of the students might be allergic to grapes. Might be. So now, is there a preference or is there a reason now to look more favorably at the strawberries? Yeah. Yeah. Why? Uh, because someone, there's the chance that there is like a negative chance to the, to the grapes uh, while there's no like negatives to the strawberries. That's kind of how I thought of it. Yeah, exa that's exactly it. Um, did I get a message? Ooh, someone mess ah. There we go. Make sure I have my chat box open. Yeah, right? So the risk that someone might be allergic, well, there's a guarantee, right, that they're allergic, but there might be a high chance that one of the students is allergic, and so we would prefer strawberries. There's the same quantity of each fruit. Strawberries could be like, but we're red and like bigger and like better because we have multiple nuclei. What is a grape? I think grapes also have that too. But like, you know, like create whatever arguments for why strawberries go, but we're better because of the da. But now when you add in the complication that there's a risk that a student might be allergic to grapes, now, the, all of the reasons for why the bowl of grapes is great and can feed just as many people as, or the strawberries, my bad, that the bowl of strawberries, or I think I said that, sorry, y'all, words. The bowl of strawberries is just as great as the bowl of grapes. Bowl of strawberries can feed just as many people. Bowl of strawberries can solve the grapes. So think of this as the negative counter plan can solve the entirety of the F. The net benefit, right, is that the potential risk of causing an allergic reaction for a young student won't happen. But if we were to do the grapes, it is more likely to occur. Y'all with me? Y'all with me with my, my fruit metaphor? 
we're understanding why net benefits are important and why without them, we're just kind of talking about grapes and strawberries, not knowing why that proves why the bowl of grapes is bad. Makes sense to me. Excellent. Okay. Okay, so let's go to the next slide. Solvency. We talk a lot about this, so I feel pretty comfortable, but here's some more evidence. And maybe Sarah, this will be good for you to see some more to feel like if this passes the test. Um, I will read, transforming all criminal immigration offenses into civil violations guts much of the political rationale for cracking down on illegal immigration. If none of them are criminal violators of immigrant law, then the argument for sending ICE into their communities to harass them, uh, to harass them diminishes greatly. Abolish ERO and revamp, revamp HSI. So ERO is just the same thing as um, ICE. That's just like the um, excessive force operations, but like ERO has a name that stands for something a little bit different, but that's essentially what ICE is, right? Is the removing, removal operations, executive removal operations um, or enforcement, enforceable removal operations. Something of the sort, but it's the whole idea of being able to remove forcibly uh, immigrants from wherever, you know, while they're in the United States and taking them to um, detainment camps uh, or centers um, and or sending them back across the border, right? A uh, little less about the back across the border because that's a whole different uh, segment of immigration law when we talk about like border officers and border patrol. Uh, but ICE is literally cops, right? They're the people who bring the people to the, um, the camps slash centers. Uh, and so, yeah, ERO mostly partners with the Border Patrol and local law enforcement agencies to apprehend illegal immigrants who haven't committed crimes. Two-thirds of ERO arrests are for non-criminal offenses and victimless crimes. ERO's responsibility for apprehending and removing the one-third of its arrests who have committed crimes should be transferred to HSI. Um, Congress should then abolish ERO and then claim a major victory. So I want to stop real quick. There's a part of this counter plan that's really, really, like this, this entire card is actually really good to explain how the counter plan solves, right? But there's the part that just said this about how um, two-thirds uh, or ERO's responsibility for apprehending and removing um, who have, uh, the one-third of its arrests who have committed crimes should be transferred to HSI. Do we see how 